we live? Okay, good evening everybody. Thanks for being here. I'll call the meeting to order and I'll briefly mention uh, meeting logistics. Anyone joining remotely, please change your display to show your first and last name. Anyone who wishes to address the council, please start by stating your name and where you live. We ask everyone to keep their comments and questions to three minutes. And if you're talking about a specific agenda item, to keep your comments germane to that topic. Anyone who wishes to speak must be called on by the mayor. And again, if you're called upon the mayor, we would ask you to make uh, state your questions or comments, but state whatever comments and questions you have rather than getting into a debate or back and forth between the council and, and the speaker. And we will have assistance to keep people on track and on time. I would ask uh, Councillor Cohn to uh, recognize herself since she is uh, appearing remotely tonight. Hi, Pilling Cohn, District 2. Thank you. All right. Um, First item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. The uh, one change that I'm aware of is that in the consent agenda, we have approval of minutes listed. That will not be happening tonight because limits, the minutes were not ready. But I believe that's the only uh, change to the agenda. And I, without objection, I'll assume that uh, minutes are, the agenda is approved. Next up. We have general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is not on tonight's agenda. As with uh, other items, uh, other parts of the meeting, we would ask you to keep your comments and questions to two minutes. I will start with the people in the room to see if there's anyone who wishes to address the council. Rebecca. And as always, uh, please start, start, start by telling us who you are. Rebecca Copans, uh, Cliff Street in Montpelier. Um, I'm here to ask you what is happening in our town. <laughs> um, we have a downtown that is being hollowed out by those who face no consequences when they fight and scream and swear and threaten our children. The rule of law is a long held covenant the social mores of civility and safety are the underpinnings of this community. The safety of, and care of one another makes Montpelier what it is. It's why I live here. I'm sure it's why you live here as well. And the silence in the hopes that our city will figure it out is not working. And so I'm here to ask you to do something. And I just want to be absolutely clear. I'm not um, being houseless is not a crime. Absolutely and unquestionably, I want to be really clear that I'm not talking about unhoused individuals. Um, to be clear, the harassment of others is a crime. Weaving drunk through streets, blocking children as they walk home from school, that is a crime. Shouting and swearing at people and threatening their body and property, that is a crime. Blocking the thoroughfare of traffic with threats of violence, that is a crime. Two days ago, a friend was walking with his nine-year-old daughter when someone propositioned her, a nine-year-old girl. That is a crime. Looming over people's cars, like my dad, so they feel like they can't safely walk to the ATM, that is a crime. Blocking a bike path between Shaw's and Taylor Street to the point that it's not safe or passable, that is an actual crime. <laughs> and there are rules for a reason, and the consequences that are created to uphold those rules were put into place to maintain safety and order. And it's clearly outlined in chapter in 13 VSA 1026. And I just want to read it to you and for everyone here. So because every time I talk about this, people are like, oh, that's that doesn't there's nothing to protect us against this. And I just want to be really clear. A person is guilty of disorderly conduct if he or she with the intent to cause public inconvenience or annoyance or recklessly creates a risk thereof, engages in fighting or in violent, tumultuous or threatening behavior, makes unreasonable noise uses abusive or obscene language in a public place, obstructs vehicular or pedestrian traffic, and if they're convicted, they can be imprisoned for up to 60 days and fined up to 500 bucks. And the, the consequence is doubled with a second offense. Your constituents need to know that they have a state statute that protects them 
and a reason to call the police when these things are happening to them. Too many of my neighbors say it's not a crime when they're verbally or physically accosted, when actually it is. I'm asking city staff and the city council to communicate to your constituents about how to report the incidences, incidents that are now happening daily in town and to remind them that there is an actual law that protects them and people should feel safe walking in Montpelier. That's all I had to say. Thank you. Did you have anything to respond? Okay. I mean, sure. I think we, this has come up a lot, and Chief's here. I don't want to put you on the spot, but you might want to respond to this. Very much appreciate and agree with all your, your comments. Um, I think the Chief can provide you the number of, of citations and arrests that have been made. And one of the big struggles we've been facing is that these cases almost always get dismissed out of court. So there, you're correct. There are no consequences. People get cited get released, no action, the next day they're out there, same thing, wash, rinse, repeat. And um, I think our police officers are frustrated and uh, you know we'll be talking about the budget later tonight about the level of public safety. It's a, it's a terrible situation. It's one of the reasons um, our city's taken a leader, lead role in organizing other communities around the state to demand sort of more resources from the state to deal with the situation. Uh, the behaviors are absolutely uh, not right and uh, I'm sorry that you and all of us are dealing with that. Uh, and you know we've all heard about it from many, many people. And uh, so Chief, I don't know if you want to talk about, I mean, just tell, her, tell them the activity level that you've had this weekend. Eric, hi, Eric Norton's the uh, police chief. That works. Uh, just to kind of reiterate, I, I agree 100%. And, we publicly post all our logs so you can see our calls for service. You can see every arrest. You can see where we go. Um, year to date, if we compare 2023 to this year, 2024, our call, calls are up 1,000. 1,000 calls more than what I had before. So I think people are, are realizing how to call us. Um, the behaviors that you're describing are often appalling, and we deal with them the best we can with the tools that we have. So um, I'm in agreement with there. We're doing the best we can with the tools that we have. Um, in July, June or July, we had the, the, the meeting with all the service providers. We've called and asked for as many service providers to help us. I've said all along, this is not just the police problem, and we're doing the best we can to, to address those problems. Um, so we've brought in our crisis worker who does just that. She was spending all of her time downtown and at the churches making sure that those people were behaving as best they could. And we've also brought in Mobile Crisis, um, which does a response to Washington County Mental Health. Um, clearly we need more and I'm pushing for more. There's a, there's a tricky funding mechanism for the state for mental health service providers that I'm trying to see if maybe somebody could look at changing the funding mechanism. Um, I don't know how much pull I would have in that, but um, you know, doing outreach doesn't necessarily pay their bills, but if they got the money in a pot so they could do the outreach, um, they could meet what they need and we could get the services that we need. So I'm looking to get some of those things hopefully looked at and at least changed. So it's not just the police, but we have service providers that are actually out there helping us with this stuff. Um, I also asked in July to, to address, you know, I think we put $40,000 into the budget to address that area of the bike path with some fencing or whatever. And the decision was made that we didn't want to do that. I, I don't know if I said at that time, I don't know if the fencing was the answer, but we have to do something. And I stand by that we still have to do something. So I might lean on you and the community to tell me it is what it is that you would like us to do. And then we can go and try and do it. Uh, but right now we're, we're buried in these calls. You know, I have what 14 officers work in the streets. Um, we're doing the best we can, uh, but we certainly can't do it alone. And I'm totally compassionate because I don't like what I see out there either. Chief, could you just tell you uh, yesterday morning at our team meeting, you told us how many calls you just had this past week? Sure. You know, I, you know, I know that the media says that you know the majority of the people are from here, and that's not what we're seeing. Um, you know, I had a gentleman from Lewiston, Maine, that showed up in 2.5 days, two and a half days. We had 20 calls, three arrests. Um, completely overwhelmed our police department you know that required us to take somebody finally into custody finally get them held get them cleared through a hospital in st johnsbury get them to you know it's five hours times two people to do these things you know and it's it's a lot for us to do um, so i certainly i'm going to continue to say that i need some help so 
curious for the the forty thousand thing. Um, so the fence probably isn't the answer from what we're seeing, but is the forty thousand better spent with more officers, more support people? Sure, I, I, I would never say no for support people. I don't think, you know, if you give me $40,000, what is that, a half a half person? A half, right. You know, am I going to be able to solve the problem with a half a person? Like, I, I'd love to tell you yes, but I don't think that, it's not that simple. Um, it requires a total wraparound of services from mental health to substance mis misuse to housing. There's there's so much to the to the process that, you know, a half a person or, you know, you could give me six more police officers. It's just going to make, you know, a thousand more calls that we can respond to. It's not going to solve the problem until we actually get to the root cause, which is mental health, substance misuse, lack of housing. Is it better than a fence? I'm sorry? Is it better than a fence? Yeah, so the fence was something we just kicked around. Um, I don't know if that's the, the answer. So, in, and the, the tricky part is, so we moved them from there. Where do they go next? And then when, how do we address that problem next? So, you know, every cause has an effect. So what, what does us putting a fence there do, and how does it affect the next place that they go? So I, I don't disagree with you that the fence might not be the right answer, but it was also just kind of a, a, a symbol that we actually know that there's something. Here's what we kind of kicked around as an idea. Does anybody have any suggestions for us to get a handle on it? And. Uh, you know, that's, we're kind of still waiting to see what, what the answer is for us in that area. Chief, I don't want to necessarily provoke an interagency feud, but uh, do you feel that when you uh, cite people and refer cases for prosecution that they're appropriately dealt with? So right now, uh, I actually was at court the other day, and I was very impressed with the prosecution. And there's a new judge on the on the uh, on the, the the board there. So I was very impressed with how they handled the situation. So I, I'm there with some optimism, but you know their their prosecution, their hands are tied as well. And you know their goal is always to get them the services that they need at, at, at different opportunities. You know, ideally we would get these people services before they got into the criminal justice system, before they even encountered the police. But there's different points of impact where we can get them the services. And right now they've refused it with our outreach. They refused it with you know our crisis worker. They refuse it when we offer it. They refuse it when we take Turning Point. We arrest them. That's the next opportunity to get them the treatment. I, sh I should. Order, this is a this is a agenda item and additional business. This is not general business. And Thank you. Uh, I should uh, <clears throat> point out as a matter of praise for the for our department that uh, <clears throat> in in my work uh, we represent people in civil and criminal involuntary mental health cases and we've had one client that we've been working with who's been traveling around the state uh, pretty much everywhere he's gone he's picked up criminal charges except the few months he was in Montpelier he didn't get any criminal charges and I think it's a credit to the uh, to your department and the way you're addressing people not necessarily purely as uh, a law enforcement uh, issue that has uh, <clears throat> that was successful in that case because given this guy three or four or six more charges it doesn't really do it do much for us this thing's gonna tip over on me I don't I don't know how to get it to stand up <laughs> any other council members before we move I just on? want to say to the the point of the original comment from Rebecca uh, by all means people should call to, and report these you know oftentimes we hear uh, about events that nobody reported so please if you if you have an incident tell us and so they can respond but it is overwhelming and it, you know uh, we're obviously here to worry about Montpelier but um, it's it's you talk to our colleagues all around the state and it's happening everywhere and it's it's definitely a huge issue and it really got worse in September once the the hotel rooms closed up and people had no place to go so it's amped up considerably since then yep I think Stan Brenner. Yeah, and Carrie. Okay, Stan. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Stan Brinkerhoff uh, from Main Street, Montpelier. Uh, I would just like to thank Rebecca um, for, for bringing this up and, and discussing it with community members. 
Um, I also appreciate the chief and members of the police staff who reached out to me uh, with some of these incidents and my my kids specifically. Um, it is it is very just, uh, concerning when these events happen. I mean, we can talk about it, um, but I've shared I think with most members of this council uh, council some some fairly scary incidents I've experienced. Um, some of them writing them down is actually rather disturbing. I fully support the chief and the work they're doing, and I, I hope we can find better ways to support this. I don't know, um, you know Rebecca actually informed me, the same she informed the council of, of what is legal and what is not legal in town, uh, which was a bit surprising to me. Um, I don't know if you know, we go so far as, as signs, um, letting folks know that, uh, let's, let's be honest, that stretch next to one Taylor Street is a high activity area. Um, there has been, you know, many incidents of, of knives and such. Um, I don't know if we want to go as far as to say, you know, here's how you contact someone, um, you know, provide an emergency, you know, call box of some kind. But uh, I wouldn't second the motion that, or the, the idea that we need to do something more uh, to support these people, to, to hold them accountable. And uh, thank you, Mayor. I hear your points as well. Thanks, Dan. Um, Chris Hancock. Uh, there. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. Uh, yeah, hi, my name's Chris Hancock. Um, I, uh, I'm hearing a echo that's confusing me. Um, You're coming through without any echo on this end, so. Yeah. I don't know what to say. <laughs> okay, here, that helps. So, um, uh, I'm a member of the uh, Recreation Board. Uh, so this is a question to the council about the uh, timing, because uh, I want to uh, try to help along the conversation about the 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 question that the, the city's confronting about the um, uh, the Elks property and whether to sell some of that back to the hub. Um, and in the discussions that we had, uh, a couple council meetings ago, um, I realized that uh, the council hasn't really been given a um, information about a fairly uh, affordable scenario for indoor recreation um, that actually depends heavily on uh, the the Elks building that's there now. Um, I have been in various meetings. I have a background in this. I've been, I've, I go back many years. I used to be a member of the uh, civic group called Montpelier Jump and Splash. We were involved in uh, trying to study what what does the city need. I was involved in some of the earlier um, uh, feasibility studies that were done. Um, so I, I've been in these conversations a lot. Um, and uh, I've also was in conversations with the uh, power wellness consultants when they came. And in those informal conversations, uh, a, a very clear, promising scenario took shape. So what I want to do is uh, take a little time to uh, cost that out uh, for the city. Uh, obviously, I'm not a consultant. I'm going to do this as a private citizen uh, who does have access to some different you know, information that I could try to pull together. Uh, I'm not aiming to produce anything near the finality of a proper feasibility study. Um, but we just have gone too far without a clear image of a path forward. And I think those of us who want to advocate for recreation have been uh, at a big disadvantage for a long time in not having a clear scenario to put uh, put out there for discussion. So that's what I think I can contribute. And my question is, uh, when do you need it? <laughs> um, ideally for me, it would be the, the council meeting after the next uh, that would give me time not only to just get some comparable cost uh, information, but maybe uh, talk it around individually to make sure I can, you know, vet the idea. But I don't know what your timeline is for thinking about uh, that sale question, and uh, if if it made a difference, I would um, push to get some information in time for the very next council meeting. Thanks, Chris.
we have some up do we have any updated information um, so we are having an appraisal done it's probably going to be another four or five weeks before we get that so uh, you know my sense would be the December 13 meeting or December 11 excuse me meeting would be plenty of time oh wonderful okay that's what I'm in for then thanks Chris thank you um, anybody in the room I'm not seeing anyone else online who'd like to address the council Steve Steve Whitaker, um, can you can you hear me? Uh, I want to point out that the I've witnessed some of these police interactions, and they would have been better ha handled by mental health workers than by police presence. Uh, I don't have a recommendation on how to uh, triage those, but. This is a crisis of your own making. This has been five years of the Homelessness Task Force and no action. And it was August when you said we needed to revisit the policy uh, quickly, I might add, and come up with uh, a remedy to the allowing people to camp safely. Uh, I'm going to read you a three-minute piece that says uh, we had a request to have an agenda item. We actually, even since the publication of last week's weekly, uh, we've had some internal discussions about an agenda item, and it's not going to be an agenda item this week. So we're evaluating what it would take to resource, you know, camping, but at the time we won't have a discussion. Coming forward, it, it is my understanding that, you know, the intention around that really was to get a sense of the sensitivity around certain areas. So with, you know, Country Club, for instance, you know, we have um, posted that as sensitive for consistency based on the policy. And I know that b based on the po prioritization of this committee, that policy is something that will be under review. And so we're kind of folding that conversation into a review of the policy itself onto the kind of see what it means and what it would take to resource something like that. We're not in a space now to be able to run. Uh, what do you mean by resource something? I mean that it's, you know, we were to establish public camping at that location or any other location for that matter. It's pretty hefty price tag in terms of the things that would be needed. And so that's what I mean. And so that we're looking at what it would cost to do that. And we can have the conversation on what as well. But, you know, we want to make sure that we can help our unhoused neighbors. We, we need to be realistic about what we have for resources. And then Don says, can we do graduated steps? I get that, Don, you know, but, and I really, yeah, for sure, but there are a range of options understood, and, you know, but I don't, I also think that there are, you know, some implications that I think we need to kind of talk through when we review the policy, because it's not, um, you know, even if we, you know, for instance, we, you know, we're talking about Confluence Park and receptacles, like, great, but I mean, you know, that's something that we would need to just sort out, sort of a plan for and fund, and, you know, perhaps that, or, a recommendation that comes out of that committee and you know I think that at this point you know what I can see going forward is probably a review of the policy and sensitivity and I think we're going to consider locations for camping you know the conversation really hasn't shifted in terms of what that means I mean we need to t identify those locations and we haven't so I think that's what's tricky or like you know the conversation about you know people needing a place to be which I totally get and it goes on and on and on the disingenuous double speak that y'all have been tolerating and perpetuating for years now has left the people outside who are desperate and acting out understandably and now you're violating their civil rights the ones who aren't making any trouble you're sweeping them off the path for no reason at all based on these uh police reports we can't get now without paying hefty fees to figure out who's who are the bad actors i agree the bad actors should be punished but you've created this mess thank you steve Anybody else looking, wishing to address the council? Please respond to that, Chief. Okay. We will, I'm not seeing anyone in, in the room or online asking for, to further address the council. We'll move to the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Move we approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, thank you. We've approved the consent agenda. We're now up to the legislative agenda. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, as you know, every year we adopt a legislative agenda, or at least consider adopting one, and then invite our legislative delegation to come in and discuss that with them. Um, our committee, the city's committee, consisted of council members Hurl and Brown and the mayor. Uh, so we met once and um, took last year's agenda and updated things that um, that had been accomplished or needed to no longer be on and, and they have made some suggestions. So the draft or their, the committee recommended agenda is in your packet. It's here for your discussion and consideration and whatever changes you wish to make and if you wish to adopt it, uh, then that will take the draft off or with whatever changes you'd like and uh, invite the legislators in uh, either for next week or if we're still talking about this then, then as soon as it's adopted knowing that our December meetings are going to be pretty busy. So I guess that's the only intro I have. I would turn it over to members of the committee to offer any other policy comments. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll say that uh, we uh, checked off a number of the items on our last year's agenda because they had been uh, accomplished. Um, we, we are still uh, putting a high priority on flood relief and recovery. Uh, housing initiatives, support for the unhoused, making major pitches for uh, substantial increases in, uh, in state resources, recognizing what the limitations are uh, from our city funds. Um, I don't know if the other members of the committee have anything to add. Okay. But so it's it's here for if anyone, other members of the council have any questions or want to move to adopt this. Uh, obviously, it's kind of it's a fluid thing because we go into the legislative session with ideas of what we hope to accomplish, what winds up happening in the legislature. Always wide open for change. So. Um. On the second page, I guess, the uh, more funding for local shelters um, <clears throat> is kind of general. I'm just wondering if I remember there was some money available for shelters, but it, it could not be used to purchase a building, for example. Is, is that a specific request that we'd want to in include? I mean, that's part of what we're talking about or, or not. Hmm making that change so that the money is available to purchase or as well as renovate or provide services for yeah i think i mean i think the intention of that language was to be as broad as possible mm -hmm. and to you know allow for whatever might come our way and not be you know just lease more space or just get, yeah. you know if there's a chance Do we to want to add that you know comma including purchase and sure. remodel or yeah. whatever whatever it takes to indicate that that's a yeah. An obstacle that we've run into. Yeah. yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah. Carrie. I wonder if we want to add emergency housing in there too. So it's not just local shelters; it's emergency housing of all kinds, yeah. no, that makes and sense. including uh -huh. the ability yep. to make purchases. So in the in that same bullet item. In the bullet item above, it does talk about temporary housing options, peer support workers, mental health clinicians. But we could include purchasing for both shelters yep. and. Lauren. Just wondering, um, Chief Nordenson, when you had mentioned that there might be, it sounded like maybe it would need a <clears throat> statutory change to some funding pool that would, um, related to like the ability to bring crisis and crisis workers or I don't remember the details, but it sounded like you were saying like funding is not currently allowed for something. And so that might be the kind of thing the legislature could authorize broader uses for. So we could put it in here potentially. So I think, you know, and I don't want to speak totally out of turn because I'm not, I don't control mental health funding, but if there was a way for 
them to restructure the way they fund mental health where the service providers actually get the pot of money to do the work that needs to be done instead of having to do certain work and meet certain benchmarks to then get paid. So in my situation, my outreach doesn't necessarily pay the bills for them to do it and they're still doing it for me. But if they were given a pot of money, I might be able to have the resources then to have more outreach to have exactly what Mr. Whitaker wants the police not doing these calls, which is exactly what we want too. Um, so the opportunity for more outreach. I don't know if that's legislative. I don't know the details of that, but um, when I meet with the, the mental health partners that I have, you know, funding is always a challenge. Hopefully that made, made some sense. Yeah, I mean, so like looking at the language we have, it says, you know, funding for outreach teams, mental health clinicians, like just knowing that at the state house, the more specific you can be, like the more helpful <laughs> this actually right. is. And so, um, it might be worth just digging in a little and seeing if there's some like we, even keeping the language here puts a placeholder. But like us being able to send over to our legislators, like mm -hmm. this, you know, opening up flexibility and how this funding is distributed, um, for example, could allow us to get more people on the ground more quickly, more effectively. And I just jotted down in that same bullet. Um, just as just allow mental health funding to include outreach just so, and then we can have, when they're here we can talk to them about more specifically anybody have anything else all right we don't have a motion yet right someone want to move to approve this so before that happens mm -hmm. um, my notes for amendments would be under um, the first bullet under advanced e economy would be to add a, a sentence that said allow mental health funding to include outreach and then in the next bullet it would say more funding for local sh shelters and emergency housing including purchasing of properties yeah and that's those are all the changes that I heard too Lauren I move we adopt the proposed 2025 legislative agenda. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. Item number seven, budget guidelines. Welcome, Sarah. While Sarah's setting up, um, just reiterate what we have talked to you about the last couple of weeks is that we're doing something a little bit different this year uh, to, to try to engage you and the community in the process earlier. Uh, tomorrow and Friday are the days when normally our staff would sit in a room together and try to come up with a budget to at least the, the, the outline of a budget to present to the council uh, in December. Um, so basically what Sarah is going to do now is go over the, the details. You've already received the memo about it, but the, the basically the details that we will be starting and to give you the opportunity to have any feedback that you'd like. I mean, obviously you can be as specific or as general as you want, and we, we certainly understand how uh, difficult the challenge is this year. Uh, so recognizing that... Um, Coming up with easy answers isn't going to happen, but we wanted to give you all and the public a chance to know uh, just how daunting things are, but also the, the types of choices that need to be made. So I'm still filibustering here until she's ready. And um, okay. Hi, Sarah LaCroix, the finance director. Um, this is the FY 2026 budget discussion. Um, the packet I handed around um, is in the slides as well. I just thought you know you could have it for reference. It might be helpful. Um, so to get started, uh, I just want to give an introduction and overview. Um, I want to 
like Bill said, this is not a budget proposal. This is a preliminary look at the compiled cost to provide city services at the current level we are providing those services. We will meet in Budget Congress tomorrow and Friday based on guidance we received from you tonight to work to pair this budget back uh, based on the guidance we get. Um, uh, in this presentation, I'll give a brief recap of the preliminary budget memo that we discussed last meeting. Um, I'll talk about the preliminary budget contemplations, the pressures on the 26th budget, uh, as well as you know, ask you some questions and for some guidance. Um, I've noted at the bottom, which you can't see here, um, but just a recap of the COLA, January 2025 is at 2.5%. The data for October CPI came out today and the Northeast region is up 0.1% from the October meeting from September um, to 3.5%. Uh, so this is the recap, you know, of what we talked about last meeting. Obviously, this is going to be an incredibly challenging budget season. Part of that pressure is the 900,000 in prior year cuts that were added back to the baseline budget, that all of our collective bargaining agreements end June 30. Um, our Blue Cross Blue Shield re health insurance premium renewal came in with a 22.2% increase. That's only for the first six months of the year. Obviously, that carries for the second six months, but we will see an another increase that impacts this budget and that increase at this time is unknown but based on how we've been trending and our utilization and issues in the insurance world it's safe to assume we will be in the teens for percentages of increase i have assumed in this budget that we will be tacking on another 15 percent in health insurance um, i wanted to call out last year during budget time we, um, given the timing of insurance renewals and releases because they're on a calendar year, our current increase in insurance with VLCT is not known, but that was one that cropped up last year after we had presented the budget and had to go back and make another $100,000 of cuts. Um, so I just wanted to make that known. Um, again, um, in CIP, we took most of the hits there for pandemic and flood revenue downgrades. And then um, at the last meeting, we also talked about potential future debt. Um, one of the most pressing ones is the bond vote um, that we may need to have at this upcoming March meeting related to the tower truck that could run anywhere between 1.9 and 2.6 million. Um, so the budget before you um, contemplates a $2.85 million um, tax revenue increase. That's 24.1% or 21.77 cents. Um, this assumes that one cent on the tax rate generates $131,000 in revenue. Um, finance has estimated that all other general fund revenues based on trend and experiences, um, those other increases are up about $192,000 this year, and total general fund expenses increased um, a little over $3 million. Um, obviously, the biggest pressures on these are inflationary cost increases, increased staffing costs, that restoration of that 900,000 um, we talked about on the previous slide, um, and then increasing CIP. Um, this slide here um, was the same as the presentation prior. It just lists those reductions that have been added back. Um, some of these were added to, for example, the homelessness line item. Um, we originally had put back the 27.5, but that also there was a request from the task force to increase that more. That's not reflected in this slide, but is reflected in the budget. So I just wanted to call that out. But aside from that, this is the same um, information you saw last time. Um, so our current pressures, our big pressures right now involve personnel costs. Um, we have added back positions that were cut from the previous budget, and those were noted in that previous slide, but those total $503,000, as well as the Parks AmeriCorps and MYCC staff at $65,000. Um, also, we have an unknown increase related to the unnegotiated and expiring union agreements. So at this time, I used a COLA of 3% for all city staff, um, knowing that there is some variability there with the expiring agreements. Um, we've also increased overtime cost about $100,000 based on the current trends we're seeing um, and the need uh, right now. And again, the health insurance costs were 22.2% increase. Uh, as I noted, the first six months and assumed additional 15 after that, that increase is approximately $580,000 um, in the city budget. 
Um, other ways, wage-based employer costs like Social Security, Medicare, and Beamers are all going up um, as well, just associated with changes in pay and changes in Beamers rates for retirement. Um, again, operating costs are also all on the rise. We're seeing it in every area from equipment to road salt and asphalt supplies, um, utilities, is, and contract costs are rising too based on inflationary pressure and labor cost pressures. So we're seeing increases across the board. Um, I also have uh, breakdowns of this in the following slides to try to um, give you a better picture. Um, so these are the, the handouts I gave you, but what I was trying to do here was show you this is the operating expenses by department, um, exclusive of wages and benefits, and you can kind of see the 25 budget, the 26 proposed, and then an increase um, year over year, and shown as a percent change of that budget as well, to try to give some perspective. It really, our operating doesn't have a lot extra um, in it. You know, we, we pared everything back and made it really reasonable to do the job that um, we all, do before you and this year's were just increases based on need ask and inflationary pressure there's not a lot here um, that you would define as an extra um, and then wages and benefits are a large portion of our budget you can see in your packets but on this slide it you know shows that wages and benefits increase about 1.42 million dollars um, from the prior year and, and that's a lot of pressure based on insurance and other related increases that were out of our control um, so this next slide um, and in your there's two pages of this in your packets and what this was trying to do was just to show you the wages and benefits and operating expenses by each department um, just so you could see those changes i was thinking that would be helpful the first page is primarily council city manager finance assessor planning um, the second slide here second page of that is police fire dpw um, so it just kind of i was trying to show you a better way to look at at this than the 50 something pages of budget <laughs> in your packet so i was hoping this would kind of help paint that picture a little bit um, so then on this slide it's the same um, type of information but this is related to the community services the rec department cemetery parks and senior center so you can see in the bottom section of this slide um, the increase and decrease in those funds but that doesn't necessarily equate directly to the increase in their transfer because um, they have other revenue sources in those funds that offset some of their expenses so the impact on the general fund you'll see at the top um, related to the increase and decrease in each of those departments um, based on the additional general fund need so um, the capital improvement plan we've talked about a couple of times um, the pent-up demand from the deferred equipment and projects is really what's putting pressure on it our equipment has gotten old and maintenance costs are increasing and trade values are decreasing um, in the fy25 budget we were able to increase cip funding to the 2.4 plan target um, but that target didn't keep up with the inflationary pressure and is not enough to catch us up and keep us moving in our um, capital plan funding the staff met with the capital committee to discuss our multi-year equipment and infrastructure plans to reach a steady state funding goal last week um, and we got some good guidance there so we're working um, to further elaborate on the three-year plan we have right now for a meeting um, next week um, the 26 funding need is approximately 3.5 million to you know do all the things we need to do catch up on some equipment and get some extra paving in based on our steady state goals but we understand there's it's not realistic to jump the capital funding from 2.4 to 3.5 in one year um, what we have proposed is a $350,000 increase this year to bump it up to 2.75 million obviously this is still not enough to catch us up but it gets us working in the right direction and um, focusing on our capital needs um, and so this is my final slide and it is um, you know basically questions and guidance um, that you can give us as we head into budget Congress tomorrow and have to work through some really hard decisions to bring this budget in at a target that you all feel is reasonable and would benefit the taxpayers the most um, 
today this is just the starting point. This isn't a budget proposal, but you know, some of the questions to consider, do you have a target increase or a cap? What are the goals and priorities for this budget? Are there areas within the budget that you do or don't want to see cut? And what are acceptable levels of service reductions? Because some of these cuts are going to mean service reductions. Um, and again, I, I just noted direction in prior years had been CPI. Um, CPI was 3.5. That increase would generate $415,000 in additional revenue, and that doesn't even cover our health insurance cost increase. Um, so really, what we're looking for is guidance as we pare this budget down and come in with a proposal on December 11th. Thanks, Sarah. All right, members of the council, we've had uh, a, a few days to uh, <coughs> to live with this, and do we have any immediate reactions other than this is a very tough. Uh, Thing to, tough set of needs to address. Tim. It seems like we probably all have thoughts. <laughs> Would it be smart just to go around the table and have everyone? Sure. Um, Do you want to go? Hard to know where to even begin with <laughs> this budget. Um, I mean, one question I had coming into tonight, I know we've talked before about things like other local options taxes, like the sales tax. Like, Are there other ways that the city can raise revenue besides property taxes? So I would love to understand if we have any options to bring in money in different ways, if there's ways to have more progressive ways to raise money so those who can afford it most can help chip in. Um, so that was one thought. I mean, yeah, I might just start with that, but I'll, I'll have more to say as we uh -huh. go around. Palin, I don't, don't want to go, go past your chair without giving you a chance. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation, and I really like that we are seeing all this information beforehand. Could we crank up the volume? Can you, can okay, you should I start again? Just, we're trying to figure out if there's a way to make you louder. Should I say something? <laughs> yeah. Is it better? Try it. Try now. Okay. How about now? Yeah. There we go. Thank okay. you. Yeah. Thank you. I was just saying that. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, this is my second two and a half <laughs> budget uh, discussions because in the first one I came on board kind of late and last year and this year. So it is good to see this information beforehand. Uh, and uh, from Sarah's presentation, uh, there was an emphasis that most of the cost is a personal cost. So my suggestion would be if we want to provide core services like public, um, um, sorry, uh, the police, firework, and public work, which position we should have must, like 100% we need these positions. So can if we can have a list, then maybe it can give us some idea. If we want to cut, uh, then uh, we will have the bigger picture. Thank you. Thanks, Bailin. Tim. Yes, Sarah, thank you for all this work and, and you and your staff. It's really well put together and, and very helpful. Um, so it looks, I mean, really the reality is our budget is 75% labor, roughly, and associated costs. And um, unfortunately, looking at the process we went through last year, we chipped around in a lot of different areas and um, didn't hire for vacant positions. And in the end, um, I don't think that approach is, there's a chance to do that again, the way this looks at the scale of 
of the numbers in front of us, also taking into account that we're in the middle of this whole period of time, the five-year thing, where we know that what's going to happen on the school side of the tax dollar is, is going to, if, if we have these pressures, I'm, I'm afraid theirs could be worse. So basically, I'm, I'm thinking, to answer Sarah's questions, and thank you for formatting it, my thought would be that we really can't go into this process saying that we're going to be able to maintain our entire labor force. We're going to have to at least be open to considering options to reduce the number of people we have, uh, because it's such a significant part of our budget. Um, I'm inclined to say as a target increase for this process, um, we should look at a CPI increase of 3.5% and, and then ask staff to come back with options for ways to, to get to that, that number. Um, within that, I agree with Palin that I think we need to prioritize our primary functions, which are going to be fire and ambulance, police, and public works. And so really, I don't want to see the cuts as much in those areas, even though they're the bigger departments with the most people. Um, I think we need to focus on, on um, the other areas that are nice, but not our primary pieces, which will be senior center, rec department, social justice center, administrative staff. And those areas are where I think we need to to look at first. Um, so I guess in terms of service reductions, there will obviously be service reductions with fewer people, and we'll have to evaluate that as we see um, where those changes may need to happen. So it's, it's not going to be easy, but hopefully um, we'll, we'll do our job and look at it and, and then make the right decisions. Thanks, Sam. May I? Uh, just mm -hmm. the community justice um, department is entirely grant funded. Um, entirely? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so there's no <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a good thing, but. <laughs> yeah, it's entirely grant funded. Yeah. But there's no savings there, yeah. I yeah. did have one other question to ask. Um, just so, for what would be the amount of money if we, as a goal amount, to say if, if we go with a, a CPI 3.5% increase, what's the delta, what's that difference we're going to have to make up? It's about 2.5 million. Two and a half million? Yeah. Thanks. Sarah. Um, thank you. Uh, Sarah, there was a number I didn't see. It was on your report that was in the packet. It was non-wage operating cost increases of 920000 almost $921,000. Yep. Is so, that lower now or, so no, oh. or higher? <laughs> complicated. Um, so the operating increases by department um, totaled about, I'm going to guess here, it was about 325000 yeah, um, yeah. There's other things in here that increased, like the homelessness task force line and other items that I didn't back out of that. I treated all of those things as operating for purposes of that number. Okay. Um, so it didn't go down. I just have tried to format the data in a way that showed all of the departments, so then, you know, the rest is a line by line in, in the packet. Yeah, okay, I was just doing a little bit of the math to... Yeah, you know, no, it when, doesn't work. <laughs> ...when trying to think about a, you know, a cap, yep. and taking the 3.4% generating 415,000, it would require almost a 7% increase just to cover the non-wage operating cost increases that are in this list, uh, which is unacceptable to me as, as well. Um, I, I agree with the, uh, with the core service emphasis. Um, I know in the past we've, we've left open positions open and out of the budget, and I would rather not do that, particularly under the kind of things we've been hearing lately. Um, I, you know, I, I'd also like to preserve as much of the of the CIP because we just keep falling further and further behind um, I mean I you know it got pretty dark for me <laughs> while I was reading this budget I I was thinking of the uh, Willie Sutton rule of budgeting you know you you've got to go where the money is um, and it, it may mean that we we need to look at at personnel somewhere, and that's a very hard thing to do, but I think we at least need to see what the options are. Uh, I'll leave it there. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for all this, this detail and laying it out this clearly. Um, 
I also agree, obviously, that a 24% increase is not something that we can do. Um, I, I, <clears throat> I think that we have to look at something higher than the, the three and a half percent. Um, and um, this is where my, my knowledge of economics is a little bit weak because I'm not, um, I feel like there must be something flawed about that, that percentage if our health insurance is going up as much as it is, if labor costs are going up like they are, if the, you know, the, the general cost of buying things and funding things is going up as much as it is. We're not talking about buying a whole lot of new stuff in most cases or um, adding on a whole lot of benefits or anything. And so, so I'm not sure that that, that um, CPI is, is the greatest figure to go from. Um, I think it would be great if we could keep it to no more of an increase than we did last year, just because, you know, it's a, it's a target. So I would be interested in seeing what the, I think it was 4.9%. Yeah. I'd be interested in seeing what that is. Um, I also agree that we have to really prioritize the services that we're providing in terms of public safety and public works. And I think it's really important to fund the capital plan according to the way you all have proposed, which is not what we need, but it helps, it's a little bit more aggressive than where we've been before and it helps kind of move us a little bit more towards where we need to be. And that's, you know, things like paving and infrastructure and um, uh, all the people that I hear from in Montpelier who tell me their opinions on the budget, not a single one of them has said spend less money on paving and less money on infrastructure. So I think that's okay. Uh, and then um, as we're looking at all the things that we cut last year, we, we worked really hard to kind of like cut every single thing we could possibly think of. And I wonder what it looks like if we don't put those things back in, if we start from, okay, those things are gone and what that does. And I know that some of that involves police and public works staff and for, you know, I, I wanna make sure they have what they need, but um, I don't, think it should be a given that we're going to, you know, refund all of that stuff that we cut last year. That's 900,000. Right. Roughly. Yeah. And I know that a lot of that is, is um, personnel costs as well and that we might want to put back in police officers and that. And so it might not make that much difference, but still I'd like to look at that. And then, yeah, I think we have to, at, because our, the largest part of our budget is personnel, like any budget, that's always true that we have to be willing to look at um, whether that's, we need to cut some personnel, um, but to prioritize not doing it in public safety and public works. Thanks, Carrie. Adrian, it's up to you. Okay, so thank you for this. Um, my brain works a little bit differently than the spreadsheets. And so I had a hard time kind of like bucketing it into different categories. And so, I mean, here are the operating expenses, which I understand. And then there's like a whole huge bucket of wages in terms of like all the people that work at the city. But I would love to kind of slice and dice it a little way to b better understand like what our core services are. So I what I wrote down is like public works infrastructure. So what does that look like in terms of the budget, including wages, and then what is the percentage of that budget? So I don't know if you have that. Uh, so on the second two pages, I tried to break it down okay. by department and by each department there's wages and operating okay. expenses, if that's helpful. So on the third page, you'll find police, dispatch, fire, DPW, um, by each of their general fund departments. So DPW streets, DPW fleet, DPW building maintenance, and those each have a bucket that is wages and benefits and operating expenses. All right, so I'll have to do some math, but. <laughs> So when I was thinking about this, I was thinking about limits, right? So when we think about bucketing, you know, public works and infrastructure, operating costs and salary, like what percentage of that budget should that be? So when I was looking at other cities' budgets, like kind of the model that other folks use is, 
you know, 30% of a city's budget, around 30% should be public works and infrastructure. For police, fire, EMS, around 30%. These are just, and I spent a lot of time looking at other cities' budgets today and averaging all of these buckets. Um, the administration, um, just the staff, the central office was 10%, parks, recreation, culture, 10%, debt 10% and um, economic developing and planning 10%. I don't know if those are the right numbers, but that is how I, when I think about a budget in terms of like the core services that we require should equal the most amount of our budget. And so I don't know if that's what this reflects because I haven't done the math, but like I wanna ensure that us as a council are very clear on what our core services are, what that details and then that's where the budget heavy numbers are gonna go. And then instead of saying, you know, our $10.9 million in wages and benefits, like how does that connect to those core service departments? And then what does that percentage look like? Because if we do end up having to cut staff, I think that will help us get very clear on, you know, where those departments need to be cut. Cause you know, I mean, nobody wants to cut staff. I mean, that's, this is not, you know, our, but I think this is a difficult decision that we're gonna have to make. And, you know, if there's the, you know, the central office has 30% of the budget based on their salaries, then that's the discussion that we have to have. But I think without that clear data and the percentages, I have a very hard time making any data informed decisions or putting any brackets around this information. So Adrian, if I could just help you out here. Um, we're obviously at the early end of this, not the tail end. When you get when you get the budget in December, you'll have all of that broken out um, with charts and the whole thing of how that goes. Uh, but just, for example, the budget we're in right now, the one that was approved, uh, we actually have 38% goes to public safety, 34.5% uh, goes to DPW infrastructure and all of that sort of thing. 14% uh, goes to what we call community services. That includes arts, culture, recreation, as well as planning, development. And about 13% goes to government services. Uh, so that's not just admin. That includes elections, tax collection, uh, assessing, um, all the things, you know, finance, uh, all, all the things that go into government service, not just, you know, sort of central office. So various functions so that's the current breakdown in our, our budget now how our funds are allocated just if that's helpful okay. so that i assume that this okay. relatively matches that okay thank you and that's all in the annual report okay. which yeah i did look at it but it was they're around yeah. yeah so the other thing i was just thinking about you know working in organizations that face this type of dilemma um in terms of you know, money coming in, money going out, there's clearly a pretty significant deficit here. Um, and I don't know the history, but has the city of Montpelier ever had an opportunity to do like an organizational, you know, effectiveness plan, looking at efficiencies within the staff and the positions, um, you know, to see where there's opportunities to, you know, improve workflows, to improve efficiencies. I mean, this is done very commonly across organizations around the world. And you know, you, I, I've, I've worked in this field for 20 years and most organizations, if there's a problem that needs to be solved, one of the easy things to do is hire someone to solve it, but that's not usually the case. And so usually there's a process, you know, it's not about the people, it's about the process. So, you know, if we're looking at potentially reducing staff, I would encourage us to think about opportunities to look at ways to improve the way we do our business because as technology improves and as you know there's opportunities out there I think that we there's always opportunities to improve how we do our work and um, especially if there's potential for you know reduced staff I would consider that thanks Adrian I mean I can just we could we'll, we'll talk about that offline we've we've done several of those happy to talk about you okay let's do more all right well thanks sarah this is uh this is kind of a grim uh presentation to start from which uh i'm sure this wasn't the day you were really looking forward to having t this week um 
A couple of things that uh, are striking to me um, are one, and this is a couple of years old or one year old for a lot of these, uh, a lot of these things, are um, our tax rate, municipal tax rate is 13 in the state. We're, re we're really not that, uh, that far off from a whole bunch of other municipalities and, and below uh, a good number of them. I, I don't, that's one of the things that makes me think that there's not a lot of fat in our budget, you know, we're in addition to which we we know, we we come into city hall, we see who's working here. It's as we talk about what um, what we're getting for our money, we don't have throngs of uh, municipal employees sitting around not doing productive work, and. Uh, I think they're everyone who's working for the city is is doing work that uh, there's legitimately a need for, and that uh, they're providing services that uh, our uh, our community members uh, value very highly. That's why people come out and support the budget pretty much every year, even in a case where we're above. Uh, the rate of inflation. Um, it's hard to see how we could possibly go to the voters with a 24 uh, percent increase. Although I was talking to a friend of mine who said that she and her husband uh, today, she and her husband are probably among the few people who would vote for that because they know the value of uh, of living in Montpelier, but I don't think the majority of people would necessarily vote for it. But uh, I, uh, I, I really can't imagine. So that's on one end. It's hard to hard to imagine we could possibly go to the voters with a twenty four percent increase uh, on the on the low end. It's. Uh, it's hard for me to see how we can make big enough cuts to get us down to three and a half percent or four, the 4.9% 4 we uh, voted uh, in March without doing uh, real damage to, uh, to what people are getting from the city and what uh, makes City uh, living in the city of Montpelier very, very valuable to people. You know, and I hear about things like, well, what are we going to do? Can we say we have to focus on core services, which we have to do? I think public safety is is vital. I think uh, you know we've received uh, all the members of the council received an email saying we should be up to over a million dollars on on paving, which. I agree we should be, but uh, I, I don't see that happening this year because the money's not going to be there for that. But if we, uh, if we take a really harsh uh, approach to, uh, to the funding and say, well, we're going to have to cut, cut some things out completely that people uh, rely on like we just can't afford to have recreation and senior center and I and staffing for the parks you know we're kind of putting up the white flag and say you know telling people you know we give up and all you people that we've been trying to get to move into the city because it's a uh, such a vital place to live and and you're contributing to the city it's the message we're sending to the to those people is well don't come here this is a city that's dying it's not uh, growing or moving forward so i i think that uh while we, we 
There, uh, there are probably things in the uh, in the ad backs, uh, the nine hundred thousand dollars worth of ad backs that we uh, that we can't afford this year. I'm sure there are. Um, but I, I think that uh, I, I would be very careful at, at what we're cutting to uh, to make sure that we're not really cutting to the heart of uh, of what people uh, see as as life in the city of Montpelier. Jack, just to follow that thought, I think one thing we've got to do is, is we have to be more innovative about how we do this process and how we look at things, and we have to be willing to be more open-minded. And just pursuing this process the way we've always done it isn't going to work. I mean, it, you know, the, the canned meat process we've been going through that worked for so many years is not going to happen this time. You've got to be more innovative. The rest of the world is around us. Um, yeah, there's a great demand for free services when people think they're free and they're getting things. Um, you have a limited number of people paying for this. And I think you have to be sensitive to them too because they're, they're carrying the water. Um, so it pays to be responsible. An innovative thought might be someone suggested the senior center as a city agency isn't, isn't able to get grant monies. But if they were a 501c3, they could still exist, provide services that people enjoy. Um, maybe not be a city agency. We might have a, an arrangement with them, obviously, for the facilities of their space. Mm -hmm. But um, allow them to open up and have that opportunity and, and have another way to bring in additional funds we can't get. Um, just a thought, but mm -hmm. I think we have to start thinking that way. Yeah, I, I, I hear that. And there may be a way, ways even to create like a, a shadow 501c3 that isn't the uh, senior center, but it is like, uh, I, I don't know. You're the lawyer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I know. Uh, I know, but I'm not a finance guy. <laughs> none of my clients, none of the people I represent have any money. So, <laughs> um, so but, but yeah, I, I, I totally get where you're coming from. Uh, one of the questions I was going to ask you, Sarah, um, is, uh, when we're talking about sources of revenue, I know I, local options tax is one thing that occurred to me, which has not uh, gotten the support of the council in the past, but in, in different times, who knows what might happen. Another question is to wonder how, um, how our parking fund has been uh, performing uh, now that the pandemic is essentially over. Poorly post flood. Still, yeah. people are just not. Well, obviously, workers aren't coming into town. Mm -hmm. um, some of the shift you'll see is um, in this budget is shifting some of the police department back into the general fund because the parking fund can't support them, um, and their primary duties are as police officers. Um, so. Mm -hmm. Well, um, is the parking fund supporting the cost of uh, running itself? Uh, we um, focused on the general fund and the um, other parks rec um, MSEC cemetery for this round mm -hmm. for December 11th. We'll have dialed in those funds. Um, I right now need to go and um, analyze revenues and costs and see how to make that fund balance in the 26th budget uh, year. Okay. Lauren, were you putting your hand up? Yeah, I mean, one question first and then a couple of possible thoughts. Um, I mean, just looking at this and seeing like recent years trends, is there any reason, it doesn't seem like any of this are pressures that are gonna go away next year. Like it seems like healthcare just keeps going up 20% every year <laughs> and like, so I mean, so is there any, like, does, is this somehow unique or is this just like the new reality of higher wages, higher costs of everything and healthcare just spiking out of control and crippling everybody? I um, would expect we will continue to see these pressures in the year just to come. I don't think this is an anomaly. Which just gets to like the more structural look. Like it's, um, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess a couple thoughts, like 
you know, when the staff is looking through, I mean, I know you always look at, and like we've already been doing this for years and years with the pandemic and then the flood of like, you know, which, which projects and wish lists can be postponed. And, you know, again, like not necessarily gonna be any better next year, but um, who knows, Trump will come in and make the economy great, I hear, so that'll be <laughs> excellent. Um, that was, um, but, you know, maybe looking at things like, are there positions or projects that we have used city funds for where there might be grant opportunities, there might be, maybe we cut it, but we do put it on a state funding wish list and we go lobby and if we can get some state funding to do it, we try to still make it work, but, um, you know, something we're, we're willing to forego, but we'll kind of put on our wish list. I mean, there's, again, there's been, part of the pressures have been things dumped onto municipalities that the state has stopped doing, and so we've now incurred increasing costs from that, too. So trying to shift some of that back, um, you know, I mean, for example, we hated to cut the MYCC program last year, but then they were able to do some fundraising and get money. So I think just like any position where we think there's some hope that we could keep a service, keep a position through some creative fundraising, state, philanthro philanthropic, um, uh, because I, I think we do have to be looking at positions, just the reality this year, um, and just with these structural challenges. Um, and then, I mean, I know one of the great benefits of working for government, and I think we should all have this, is healthcare, but I don't know if there's any like bigger, you know, like our nonprofit offers a stipend and we don't pay for healthcare and people go get it on their own. Like, are there just like bigger systemic things we need to be looking at that are like the huge costs? I don't know that we would even want to go to anything like that, but just if wages and healthcare are like the biggest drivers, is there anything else we could be doing in that space to not be in the case where every year it's a 20% increase off the board, off the, before we've started anything else? Um. I'll take comments from the public if we don't have any more immediate thoughts from council. Steve. Uh, briefly, I will caution about outsourcing to nonprofits. We've got our emergent, our essential government function of our emergency preparedness plan being done by a nonprofit behind closed doors, and that could not and should not be allowed. Uh, they don't adhere to public records law or open meeting law. Um, you might want to reconsider, move to reconsider your vote on the legislative agenda and add to it uh, support for uh, implementing existing law. There's been law on the books to allow, to require the Secretary of Transportation to collect fair market value rent for use of the public right of way by utilities. It's not been collected in 17 years. A strong effort was made last year to try to move that forward as a way to pay for public safety dispatch, uh, and it was sidelined. But this, that money from state highways needs to go into the transportation fund according to statute. But it would apply equally to municipal highways. And every Green Mountain Power pole and wire and first light fiber and uh, these new Green Mountain Power you know, level three charters, that's half a million dollars or more worth of equipment. Uh, it's probably a million dollars worth of taxable uh, plus fair market value for that prime real estate that they are occupying. That could be a revenue source. We need to really Steve, consider- Steve, let me jump in. Yep. Uh, are there, is, is this a statewide thing and are there yes. any municipal, one, one statewide, two, are any municipalities doing it? And three, what's the, uh, what are the forces or what is happening at the state level to try to make this happen? Uh, last year, a study was uh, ordered for transportation agency. There's a b bunch of fudging going on of, oh, it'll cost more to, to collect than it will bring in. That's absolute nonsense. The governor does not want, uh, he considers it a new tax, even though it's been on the books for 17 years and not being collected. It could bring in millions and millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. The property tax on that infrastructure, again, the, the chargers, for instance, we are able to charge property tax, but that now has been s 
uh, aggregated to a central state level PVR is going to hire one assessor experienced in utility infrastructure assessment. So, but anyway, I would, I, I don't have, you it's, got it's, to suspend my clock. Well, that, that's, that doesn't come out of your time. Okay. Uh, so anyway, moving to reconsider and explore or support the ability of municipalities to collect rent consistent with Title 19, Section 26A uh, on the right-of-way use uh, for local revenue. You can't do it on the state highways. That goes into the T-Fund. Um, so that's important. Gas, electric, telephone, broadband, Lumen Level 3, First Light, VTEL, Comcast. All, there's a lot of infrastructure here that we could be taxing. Uh, we need to talk about a regional dispatch facility. We're paying rough numbers. We're collecting 400000 and we're costing over a million. So we're paying 600000 uh, for dispatch. We would be paying maybe half that if we were paying into a regional facility. Um, that work is, go again, going on statewide. Uh, I don't think it's on track, but that's, we, were, we moved in the wrong direction by being selfish and saying we want to preserve our mon monopoly with no oversight. Uh, and now we're going to have to start over reforming the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority. Um, I want to, it seems that the public employees are being held harmless here. They're getting a cost of living adjustment plus uh, massive increases in health care while those, uh, the rest of us are paying for it. Uh, I, I take issue with the equity issue there. I can't afford insurance, nor do I get a cost of living increase. Um, one more thing, I, I look, start looking $10,000 for travel for the city manager, you know, on top of the salary, on top of 1800 for parking fee, on top of, you know, I think we need to do a, a real uh, administrative audit of what we're paying. Because it seems like my study of what's going on with the, what was supposed to be the sustainability position at over $100,000 to make the district heat system in the black is being used to do all the work the city manager used to have to do on contracts for maintenance of buildings. And so we've got the communications person doing part of Bill's work. We've got Lumber doing part of Bill's work. We've got Kelly doing part of Bill's work. It, it's like we've just spread it out, spread out the work and increased the cost. We're probably paying over half a million dollars for that set of people. Uh, and I think some trimming is in order. I'll leave it there for right now. Thank you. So uh, the concept of total compensation is is actually worth looking at, I think. I mean, and this reminds me, this whole situation reminds me of 2008, which is when the corporate world that I was in started doing that. They started saying, well, look, uh, insurance costs went up. So your total package is valued at X instead of you know, what it was before. And I mean, it's a tough conversation to have to people who have to buy stuff that also has gone up in cost. But in fact, it does represent a, um, an increase in the total compensation package when we provide um, those sort of benefits at a significantly increased cost. So it might be something to look, to look at. So I guess I have a clarifying question for insurance. What is the insurance rate? Um, like how much does the employee pay for insurance? Is it 100% that the city provides or is it prorated or? So the, uh, a single, if you're taking a single plan, you pay 5%. If it's a two person or family plan, the employee pays 20%. The city pays the balance. And um, you know, all those ideas I think are fair and certainly insurance has been a, been a big issue. Um, we have four collective bargaining agreements, all that expire in June 30, so it would require renegotiation with all of them, uh, or at least three of them, to uh, change the health plan um, significantly. Um, you know, we certainly have some ideas, even within the existing structure, of things that we would be proposing and trade-offs and those kinds of things. But uh, for sure, uh, health health insurance has been, you know, just this 
ridiculous inflationary driver for as long as I've been sitting in the seat. It's just, you know, there's no other, there's no other line in our budget that, you know, if it goes up 10%, we're like, well, that wasn't too bad. Right. I mean, it's like, you know, it's just really, uh, ridiculous. And this year is, you know, I, I, uh, I was just reading in the paper about Callis, the town of Callis, right, with their eight employees and how they're like, we've got to do something because health insurance and all these other costs are driving up. I mean, it's just really a bad situation. So, yeah, all of that needs to be considered, and all of that also needs to be considered. You know, we're in this weird situation where um, we want to attract employees, particularly public safety employees and those kind of things, and we are competing in that market. So you know, uh, whether we like it or not, that is kind of the standard for, you know, those positions. So if we're trying to recruit police officers, for instance, and we've got these caps on it and other places are paying 100 percent, you know, so it's also weird as that put us in terms of recruitment and replacement. So they're all things to be considered. I'm not saying we can't do it. I agree. We have to be as open as possible to things, but it's a delicate balance all, all along uh, with with those kind of things because it's also you know filling it, it's what's the market rate to fill vacant positions right we're already having trouble doing that with, with what with the packages we have now so with health insurance we did receive a very favorable increase last year um you know and at that time the writing was on the wall that the, likely this year it would hurt more and yeah and and we know what what's look what things are looking at like for BCBS that uh, they're in real trouble. Yeah, I, it does um, appear that there will be an inherent seven percent um, increase f from Blue Cross Blue Shield over the next few years um, each year, and that's exclusive of our um, experience. So if our experience in the plan does poorly, um, I would expect that the percentage, like I said, is in the teens. Um, Sarah, one of the things that, which is more of a meta or a process question, which is that uh, we discussed earlier, uh, like months ago, the idea of trying to come in with uh, the budget for the utilities at the same time as a uh, general fund budget. And are we still thinking that that's a feasible Absolutely. approach? Um, on the 11th, the presentation will include all funds, parking, water, sewer, um, and district heat. Great. Terry, did you have your hand raised? Okay. I'm sure you didn't get everything you wanted out of us tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I'd say, that honestly, the conversation was helpful. I, you know, I think it's, we've got our challenges, and, uh, you know, we'll, We'll do. We'll see where we end up next couple of days, and um, you know, it's possible we'll come in with, you know, maybe a first, first run at it on December 11, and say, here's, you know, we got to go from here to here, or if do you want to go from here to here, and where do you want to go with that? So, you know, we might have a few approaches for you to approach. One of the reasons we wanted to get you sort of in the loop as early as possible, so you know. Uh, I mean, this is what we deal with every year. Certainly not. <clears throat> to this level, but it's usually, you know, one and a half million or something like that. And when you see it, you know, we kind of come in with the little package and say, here, we brought it in at CPI. And this is the kind of, but this year is really extraordinary for lots of reasons. So, yeah, it's good to be but here. We would have shown you this anyway, even if it hadn't been this bad. This was our plea. <laughs> so. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, Looking at where the, we are on the agenda, I think I'm going to suggest we take our break now. Uh, come back at uh, in the 808 to 810 range. <coughs> okay, next up, we have item eight, appointments to the youth committee. Congratulations to Adrian. Or, uh, Palins, I'm sorry, that's right. Congratulations, this is very good. We have several applications for this. Um, and we have, we've, we've got a range of options from going into 
uh, ex executive session to um, to just going ahead and uh, uh, moving the uh, nominations. What's your pleasure, Carrie? Do we have a? Um, we specify a number of members of the committee. I can't remember. I think, and Palin can jump in here. I think we had said seven, but when. She, but they, we only got five that were interested in a way to get it started. I also just want to note that there, obviously, uh, we had used a template, so it does mention the Montpelier Tree Board, but that we are not making appointments to the Tree Board. We are making appointments to the Youth Committee. Uh, but everything else is correct in, in there. So. And as you read the applications, they know what they're applying yeah, for. Exactly. Yeah. But I just. Palin, yes. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah, to answer Terry's question, uh, Bill is right. Um, there are seven seats uh, at the committee. We have five applications. We have four from high school and one application from middle school. So our aim is to promote the committee at the middle school a little bit more. Then if we can get two more middle uh, schoolers, um, to serve at the committee, then it will be great. So um, five is a very good start. And I can make the motion, it is okay. I, I agree. I think it's a great thing that we have young people who are uh, wanting to be engaged in how the city runs. And so I think, Palin, yes, please do make the motion. Uh, I make a motion to appoint Elena Guadagno Ardacon, guiding Cass, Otis Taylor, James Ashley Carr to the uh, youth Montpelier Youth Committee. Is there a second? I'll second. Any discussion? Or Just I see, I think at least one of them online. I don't know if often we have them introduce themselves. Oh. Or at least we'd love to say thank you for <laughs> oh, yes. applying if, the series. If there are people. I thought I saw. Gideon, Gideon. If, they, if they want to. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Gideon Cass from uh, Ridge Street. And thank you for, for volunteering to do this. I hope it's as interesting to you as this work is to us. <laughs> All right. Um, and is there anyone else? I'm not seeing anyone else, but uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Good. Well, thanks to all the students. We look forward to working with them. Can I add one more thing? Yes, please. Uh, if I um, mispronounce Gideon's name, sorry. So. Uh, now I know. And also, uh, after the applications, um, I've noticed that because all the people reach out to me, and we realize that our comedy um, application form is not really suitable for youth people because it doesn't highlight their experience. So maybe our first goal uh, will be revise it and make more uh, friendly to youth applicants. Maybe we can use two different forms. So thank you. Yeah, good point. All right, next we have an appointment to the Planning Commission. Uh, Timothy Sinat has applied, and this is not a reappointment, this is a new appointment. Who's he replacing? Oh, potentially replacing. Uh, Mike Miller, Planning Director. He is filling the vacancy from uh, whose term expired? One of them that had expired this year. Trying to, it'll probably come to me as soon as I sit back down. But yes, we have one resign this year. It's an open seat. Got it. Great. Thanks, Lauren. Um, I move we appoint Timothy Sinat to the Planning Commission. And is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? 
Timothy, thanks to you two for volunteering to do this, even though you're an adult. <laughs> Next up, Growth Center. Um, so I think you recently received uh, an email from our attorney uh, concerning this. Uh, I don't know that there's any requirement at this point that we need to go into executive session to discuss this. I think we have a plan forward to move forward. Uh, if you'd like to discuss it, we can. Um, but I think right now it will take a little bit longer, but I think there is a path for us to uh, renew our application for the amended growth center uh, as long as we provide all the, uh, the necessary information f for the, the new property. And so they're getting us sort of the list of what we need. So I think the question that we'll have to consider um, going forward, I was just kind of chatting with Tim during the break about this, you know, we, uh, if we want to kind of stay on time, we, the plan was that once we got the growth center, we would start the TIF application. And even with the, the first delay, when we thought we were gonna have to wait until the master plan was complete to f get final approval for the growth center, we could, you know, the thought was we could start the TIF application while that was happening so we didn't lose time. This will take a little bit longer time to get the growth center, so if we, if we wait for that and then sequentially do the TIF application after that, you know, we will be closing in on the end of 25 before that's all done. So. We don't have to make that decision tonight, but we, we might want to consider whether we we start the TIF application with the anticipation that we will have an, ex, a, an approved growth center at some point. Um, but, you know, that's like a $50,000 call. So it's not one that you just do, you know, off the seat of your pants. So we put that on a future agenda. But just, so I point that out um, because it's really time and money, so. Any questions or anything from council? Members of the public? Uh, Steve Whitaker again. The, are you voting on the uh, $2,000 legal thing or is that no longer relevant? The memo said you wanted to spend a thousand or two on a lawyer. The, I was really informing them that those were the costs. If we were to go through an appeal process and all that, which we're not doing. Okay. So, yeah, it, if, if we had only read the statute before we put our application in, uh, which any, you know, attorney could have done, a city manager could have done, a planner could have done, read the statute and see that it has to be according to an original application and that it requires maps. It needs a, maps to include all of the infrastructure, the roads, the water, the sewer, the sidewalks, and those have to be costed out and they have to be in an approved capital plan. I don't see how we're going to have, especially if we're tying up a million two in bonding uh, on Isabel, I'm not sure whether we're going to have an approved capital plan for the entire property. Uh, an email just surf surfaced dated the 18th that indicates that uh, there's discussion of a three-phased approach where we only build the infrastructure up to the clubhouse and then we do the internal roads and then we do the bridge later. But that would be really dishonest to the public to not show them the full costs because there is discussion of whether we develop this or sell it. And I think we need to know what the full costs of getting roads in and out of that property are going to be. And I've said that since before we bought it, you know? so. I believe that a lot of planning is needed, that we are not on the right track. We have not implemented the next steps that White and Burke recommended in their report on June 28th of 23, which was accepted and not adopted. So I'm happy to share the email that Miller wrote that says that here's five million here, here's a yet to be determined number there, and here's a, here's a three phase approach. Fraser put in his uh, report on the first that our long-term vision for the property. It's like, where the hell is this long-term vision and whose vision is it? Because we have, in effect, sidelined our public engagement process to complete the due diligence, find out how much of it is buildable, and find out where it's, where it's buildable, and then what types of, complete a housing assessment for what types of housing we need and how many people are, are gonna wanna live there. 
Um, so there's a, I think that the planning needs to be done with the planning commission, but it needs to be a bigger process. I don't recommend spending White and Burke rates on it. I think we need to use some of our local resources and organizations to pull that process together. And it needs to be, if it's done by, coordinated by nonprofits, it needs to be by contract, open, transparent, public records, open meetings, uh, which is not, which is a, but anyway, that's, that's a nutshell. I'm gonna send around the email about the three phase and you've seen the, everything but the, the vision, the long-term vision for the property. Thank you. Um, any council members have any questions before we move to the next item? Because this is really just a report. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next item on the agenda is uh, the um, tax appeal. And this is something that I think would be appropriate to do a motion or a, a motion to go into executive session. And so this is the one my, that requires. Right. But my question was going to be do you want to do everything else? First, okay. and then just do the executive session. We just have the council reports and things, and then we'll be done with the public port, you know. Sure. Yeah. That's I mean, good obviously, idea. we still good have idea. to come out of executive session and take any action in public session. But, but other people will have to wait around. Or exactly. Whatever. Yeah. Okay. Council reports. Adrian? Um, nothing, thank you. Carrie? Um, I just am hoping that we can follow up in a more deliberate way uh, with the topic that came up at the very beginning of the meeting about downtown safety and um, stuff that's going on down there because it is quite concerning. Um, and uh, but I, you know, I don't. I think this is one of those areas where the police aren't the answer and city government isn't the answer. That it, this is a whole community issue and we need to be thinking about it from a really from a full community perspective. I don't know exactly what that means, but I want to have those kind of conversations rather than expecting the police to just take care of it all, which is unrealistic and um, and not appropriate. But we really need to be thinking about what the culture is like in our downtown and what you know what f there are things that people wouldn't do downtown right now. Um, because it's just wouldn't be acceptable. Um, and there are things that people are doing now that they wouldn't have done 10 years ago, maybe. And so what, what's happening there? And what can we do to try to steer it back in a better direction? Mm -hmm. So thanks, Paul. Hey, thanks, Gary. So uh, no report. Jim? Um, still pitching that land we're trying to sell in, on Main Street. So hopefully we'll get a sign on it and get some promotion of it out there. But. It's a great spot if anybody's looking for a downtown city. It, it, it really is. I would love to see uh, productive uh, use to that property. Um, Palin? No report, thank you. Uh, Lauren? I'll pass tonight, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, mayor's report. Um, this. Uh, this weekend, Saturday evening, is the uh, is the event for the lighting of the uh, of the bridges uh, downtown and a lantern march through the uh, through the downtown. It's going to be a great event. I encourage us all to be there. Um, and, I th and I think that's it. Thank you, uh, John. Um, just as far as the election went, if anybody's curious, um, went okay. <laughs> this was just far and away the most difficult election that my office has ever put on because of the just some changes in the way things were done and, uh, and uh, the mail-in um, dynamic. But we pulled it off thanks to volunteers. Again, we had an incredible surge of volunteers. Um, a lot of folks who stepped up to help out, a lot of folks who were ready to step up if, if something you know, happened and we needed them at the last minute. It was just amazing. And I am so grateful because you just, we, we can't, can't do it without them. It just wouldn't happen. Um, but we're getting caught up now on all the other work my office is supposed to be doing, so <laughs> that's it. Thanks. Bill. Um, well, I was going to thank the clerk and all of his volunteers for 
the great job on the election. I appreciated that. And um, thank all our staff for all the things they're doing, particularly the police. They really are getting overrun with calls. And I think, you know, fire has been picking up a lot of ambulance calls too, thanks to these circumstances. We are getting a lot about that. And budgets weighing heavily on all of us. So we'll be, we'll be digging in and uh, we'll get back to you after Thanksgiving with where we land. But that's all I have. All right. So next up, we have the tax appeal to discuss. Right. And this is the um, one of those ones where we would, to go into executive session, we would uh, require two motions. Is some, someone prepared to make them? Yeah, and they're listed in the sheet. So I'll start out by saying the chair would entertain a motion to find the premature general public, public knowledge of the uh, issues in litigation in the Jacobs tax appeal would clearly place the, substan the city at a substantial disadvantage by disclosing its uh, litigation posture. Would someone like to make so, that motion? And is there a second? second? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 And then next. Enter, go ahead. Um, I move we enter executive session under one VSA 313A1E to discuss civil litigation to which the city is a party related and we to the would, Jacobs property. And we would have the uh, city manager and the assessor. Uh, and assistant city manager if she'd like to join. Okay. City manager and assistant city manager. And the assessor come in. And and, okay. Is there a second? Second. second? All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. 